Are you looking for a new job? Are you hiring but can't find diverse, talented candidates? Look no further because we are here to help you out. Head on over to revisionpath.com forward slash jobs where you can browse listings, post your own jobs, and sign up for email updates when new job listings are posted. This week on the job board, Propel is looking for a senior product designer for their growth team, as well as a creative director. Both positions are looking for remote applicants, but are also looking for applicants in Brooklyn, New York. Mosaic is looking for a senior product designer. This is a remote position. Make sure to head over to revisionpath.com forward slash jobs for more information on these listings and others. Get started with us and expand your job search or recruiting efforts today. Revisionpath.com forward slash jobs. You're listening to the Revision Path Podcast, a weekly showcase of the world's black graphic designers, web designers, and web developers. Through in-depth interviews, you'll learn about their work, their goals, and what inspires them as creative individuals. Here's your host, Maurice Cherry. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Revision Path. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm your host, Maurice Cherry. Now, I've got a couple of just really quick announcements uh, before we get started with the episode. First off, if you haven't seen it yet, we released our holiday gift guide just a couple of weeks ago. Now, if you're still looking for that last minute gift for a friend, coworker, significant other, family member, etc., then you might want to check our gift guide out. We had a lot of fun putting it together. We've got a lot of great books and other things that are on there. So if you want to check it out, you can go to the link that we have for it in the show notes or just go to revisionpath.com and click on the pop-up that comes up. It'll take you right to the gift guide. Also, we released a bonus episode a few weeks back on the design of Black Panther Wakanda Forever. It's a really deep dive conversation with myself, Regine Gilbert, Jordan Green, and Paul Webb, and we go deep into the plot, the music, the symbolism, the art, and just the overall design of the film. Now, we do spoil the entire movie in the podcast episode, so if you haven't seen the movie yet, go see it, but then definitely check out our episode and let me know what you think about it. Also, if you've listened to Revision Path for any amount of time this year, then you know that we have our job board and we have the 10th Collective, which is this new talent collective initiative from Revision Path and State of Black Design. Well, now the job board and the talent collective are combined. So when companies add listings to our job board, they also will get access to members of the 10th Collective. And if you're a member of the 10th Collective, if you're a black designer, that means even more companies are going to be available to you for your next opportunity. Now, if you're not a member, don't worry. It's super easy to sign up and it's free to join. There's just a short profile that you have to fill out and you're all set. As a member of the 10th Collective, you'll only get contacted by companies when they are ready to talk to you. So no spam or anything like that. And you can also hide your profile from certain companies or just remain completely anonymous. The 10th Collective is really meant to be a resource for black designers that are looking for their next opportunity. So you might be talking to recruiters. You might be talking to headhunters. You might be doing your own job search. Consider the 10th Collective as just another tool in your toolkit to find what your next opportunity is. Head over to the 10th Collective.com to join or check out the link in the show notes. This episode of Revision Path is brought to you by Hover. Building your online brand has never been more important, and that begins with your domain name. Show the online community who you are and what you're passionate about with Hover. With over 400 plus domain extensions to choose from, including all the classics and some fun niche extensions, Hover is the only domain provider I use and trust. So what are you waiting for? Go to hover.com forward slash revision path and get 10% off your first purchase. Now for this week's interview. This is the second part of our two-part interview with design strategist and design educator, Andrew Bass. Let's start the show. You mentioned when you were at Pratt's that you saw it like you had black design professors and stuff like that. Once you got out there as a working designer, did you see a lot of black folks like in design leadership back then? No, no, no. That was the unicorn. 
I was in the libraries. That was one of the things all through my years as a student to my beginning years as a practicing professional. I would hit all the design annuals, books to see who's leading in the industry to kind of know names. And I kept coming across the same thing. It was always white men. It was mm-hmm. all these white men. Eventually, it started opening up a little bit where you see the spattering of white women. But it was all predominantly white men. And I barely, barely ever saw anyone, black, Latino. Occasionally, there may be a, a spot, a spot of an Asian. Now, and again, usually it would be a guy. Now, but it was very much pure white. And that's all I ever saw. And I was actively searching to find, okay, there's got to be more folks out there. And then eventually I did find some folks out there, not through any of the exposure through manuals. At that time, there were not a lot of big design conferences. I had not heard of AIGA at that point yet. And Mm -hmm. definitely there was no how. There was no how design. Yeah. Um, And there was communication arts. Because there was a lot of design magazines out back then. Print, design, communication arts. What was the other one? Step. Uh, Step was there. Yep, Step. Yeah. Uh, applied. This is a Canadian one. Applied Arts, I think it's called. Mm-hmm. And some other stuff. And so it was not until somewhere in around 93 in print when I saw Cheryl Miller's article on, not about Cheryl Miller, I should say. It wasn't her article. Or was it her article? But it was in print about where are the black designers? um, Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I read that article like, I don't know how many times writing out these names. I'm like, who's this person? Who's that person? Oh, wow. Because I had not seen that in any of the, quote, general mainstream stuff. And that's when I started learning that, yeah, there were folks out there. Um, Mm -hmm. And I started digging a little bit more into history. And that's when I learned that there were a lot more that actually existed back in the day, just never given any exposure due to societal, the U.S. uh, view on race, you know. And so growing up, I never saw any of the studios that I admired ever have any person of color in their leadership now. And generally the ones that I did find in leadership, they usually owned their own businesses. They had their own practices. I really am hard pressed to think of any leaders at any of these Fortune 500 companies throughout the 90s to even, I say, early 2000s. Nothing pops off in the top of my head. There's always people doing their own thing. Yeah. And so a few years later, I think that was around 95, 96. That's when I discovered how, how magazine. Uh, which mm-hmm. I sorely still miss today. That was a fantastic design magazine. They actually, of all the other design magazines I had saw, they actually seem to have tried to make an effort of showcasing designers of color and somewhat kind of touching the subject of diversity in the in the industry because diversity didn't exist back then in the 90s. That wasn't a word. Some marketeer came up with diversity. Hey, I think this is going to be a good trend. Um, <laughs> I was basically looking at it as like, fair is fair. It's like, it's just not white folks out here. Yeah. So, so I really started to see leadership until around then, around 95, 96, when I started seeing that. And then I started seeking them out. And then I learned Cheryl Miller here was here in New York City. Mm-hmm. Actually did actually meet her face to face. I think I did a, a freelance project with her. Oh, nice. Um, ooh, she was tough, too. Was I no believe joke. it. I believe it. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. I believe that without she knew a doubt. Her stuff. She knew her stuff. Um, but, <laughs> and I understand why she was very sort of stern. Because, I mean, the industry, it was a very different mentality. She had to fend for herself on stuff. And she was doing some some major work. Mm-hmm. I got to meet, um, I also met Cynthia McKenzie, I believe. Okay. She has a studio in uh, New York, too. CM something, something. Oh, man. I met her, and I was like, oh, wow, okay. And then I 
started meeting some others, uh, especially my, like I said, my professor, Dwight Johnson. He's the one who really started giving me some opportunities where he was connected to NBC. He got me to meet some people at NBC. No, I didn't meet any black people at NBC, but he started putting me on to folks that are out there. And then I started learning about Archie Boston, started learning about Tony Gable, uh, rest in peace, started learning about uh, Richard Baker. I started learning about, oh, oh Eli Kintz, mm, yeah. Maurice Woods. And that was a little later in the 90s. Oh, how could I forget about the South? It was where <laughs> I met her, Cynthia Wally. Oh, yeah, here in Atlanta. Yeah, and then also Turner, Turner. They were illustrators um, where I first saw them in How. Oh, I think the name is Turner. Last name is Turner. I cannot remember the first name. They're based in Atlanta. I think they're still around. And I started learning about more folks. And I was like, whoa, how come they don't get shine in these magazines? Mm -hmm. Now, I just went into overdrive to try and find as much history as I could. That's how I started finding it about George Olden. And I was really, I'm still stuck on his story and the, um, the total disrespect I feel that the design industry has given him completely. Yeah. And still sort of like, I wonder if I hadn't brought up George Olden to Rick Raffay back then before there was design journeys and all that, because I had mentioned an idea on that and they, they named the design journeys that they honored George Olden, what, two years after when I was on the t- task force it mm-hmm. just dissolved. And then, oh, now you decide to award George Alden the, the medal. I'm like, you, mm, okay. But at least he got it. It's like, I just feel like there needed to be more of an acknowledgement to it. And yeah. I was like, I'm sorry. And an apology. <laughs> so, because I read that he also had won an art director's um, medal, art director's club medal, but I could not find any records of that. Mm-hmm. I did not see any of that leadership until I've kind of found it on my own. And I like the fact that they were leaders on their own. They didn't wait for other people uh, because they couldn't get certain opportunities. They made their own. John Morning, that's the other name in my head, John Morning. They did it for themselves. It wasn't until, honestly, 21st century, early 2000s, that I started seeing black leadership. Mm. Now, now, I still say it wasn't like top tier black leadership. I'd say, you know, I still think some of it was just, okay, cement, not semantics, but um, perceptions, you know, yeah. to start, let's putting some folks here. So I think they were more like middle leadership, not top leadership. Right. So even today at 2022, I mean, yeah, you have a few that in, I mean, truly you can say top leadership, but it's nearly not enough. Um, yeah. So. It was very, very barren in those early years that you had to find it and dig to see it. Mm -hmm. I remember, and I want to talk about AIGA because that's an important part of your story. But like, I remember Mm -hmm. when I first started doing Revision Path, I did a lot of research, like leading up to wanting to start this. Mm -hmm. And I came across like, you know, those older magazines you mentioned, like Step and... I mean, communication arts is still around, but yeah. how, and yeah. I wonder actually for how, because how was based out of Cleveland, I believe, or like somewhere in Ohio, like yeah, the Midwest. Somewhere over there. Mm-hmm. I wonder if that informed the perspective they had because so many of these other design publications were like out of New York. And so maybe it was through a more, for them, it was through a more New York lens. I don't know if that's the case, Yeah. but question. I remember doing a lot of that research and yeah, I would see where people would like write a letter to an editor at like step or, or something and be like, well, where are more black designers? And the magazine would be like, Oh, well, we don't know where they are and we can't find them and all this sort of stuff. And I'm yeah. like, I was one of those that wrote a letter. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, they're out there. But then granted, this is also a time before the, well, I don't want to say necessarily before the internet, but really more before the World Wide web. Yeah. When you started to, when people were in the, um, where people could create these destinations for people mm-hmm. to go to. Like I, yeah. I discovered the internet in, or the World Wide web, I should say in high school in the mid nineties. And like, 
I mean, I was in a lot of places I probably shouldn't have been just in terms of like the fact that the web was just such a big place. And so, yeah. you know, there were things like AOL Black Voices and, yeah. and Africana.net and Net oh, Noir wow. and, and, <laughs> and all those places. And like, so there were obviously places where people were trying to create these destinations for Black people. But I don't think those social connections really became prevalent until, of course, like the 2000s with the advent of social media and stuff. Mm-hmm. So I was doing my research to try to start Revision Path, and I would see that a lot of people were asking these questions, and the editorial boards would just like shrug their shoulders, like, I don't know where they're at. I don't know where they are. And I remember through that research also discovering, or finding out, I should say, about the Organization of Black Designers mm-hmm. and how they kind of started out in the Midwest, like I think it was either in Chicago or somewhere in Ohio, but like starting out there and then building things out. Yeah. Did you know about them back then? Yeah. Oh, that's a whole nother story. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I did. I found out about them early 90s, actually, because I found out about them. And that's how I found out about Fo Wilson and Michelle Washington. Yeah. See, now these names are coming back. Um, Yeah. Because, I mean, Michelle works. uh, She's a teacher at, at City Tech right now. Yeah, I know about OBD. And I actually went to one of their conferences. I can talk about that after AIGA because that's a whole nother thing. So I, yeah. I don't want to lose track of, of where we're going with AIGA. Yeah. Let's talk about that. So you mentioned Rick Graffay, who uh, yeah. was, I think, a longtime executive director yeah, he was. Yeah. for AIGA. Yeah. And uh, you kind of worked with them back in the mid 2000s to yeah, not only 2016, 2017. No, actually, been, no, 2015. Earlier. Yeah, actually, yeah, you're right, earlier. Yeah, it's been a lot earlier, yeah, because you, because, yeah, because Rick, I think Rick retired or no, left or I'm something. Sorry. It was 2006, 2007, 2008. That's okay, so like, okay, yeah. right around that time, because I think yeah. Rick left, I want to say in like 2013, 2014, yeah. something yeah. like that. Yeah. yeah, But But you had worked with AIGA to not only create the diversity and inclusion task force, but also serve as chair. Tell me what that was like, because if diversity was not even in the conversation with regards to the design community, like how much of an uphill battle was that? Sure. I don't even think we even got the first step. (laughs) So, Honestly, looking back, it was all for show. It was Mm -hmm. all for show. How that all came about was step in design had an article based on women in design. Very good article, very interesting. I was kind of starstruck that, you know, not starstruck, I was kind of awestruck that out of all these listing of women designers, how come there weren't any people of color on you? Mm. Yeah, I think there was one, and I think it was Lucille, and I never really know how to pronounce her name, but Teneza, uh, Lucille Teneza, she's a name in the industry, does some school stuff. So I believe she might be either Filipino or... She's Filipino. I know you're talking okay. about. Yeah, Lucille you know, Tenazas or something yes, like that. Yes, yes. And I yeah. was like, you got one person on here. There's a whole lot of other people out here. So I wrote a letter to Step in Design at that time just saying, you know, hey, great, great article, cool, Matt, but hey, you're kind of lacking X, Y, and Z. And I, I rolled off some names that I knew of, mm-hmm. you know, such as Cheryl Miller for Wilson, Michelle Washington. And just questioning, I was like, you know, if you're going to do a compilation like that, you really need to be a more thoughtful and full approach in doing these kind of compilations. Yeah. You know, and at the time, the editor in chief there, Emily Potts, actually replied back to me via my email. I was like, oh, I didn't know I was going to get an actual response. And she actually struck up this conversation. I should say we struck up this conversation. And she had told me she was in having conversations with Bill Grant at the time, who was AIGA president. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Board of director president. Um, yeah. And he, that was one of his issues. He wanted to sort of expand AIGA's reach and so that it becomes more inclusive to people and stuff like that. And she told me, you know, would I be interested in talking with him and that she'll put me together with him? And I said, sure, I don't mind talking. You know, talking is free. It's not going to hurt anybody. So within a span of, I guess, a day, she got me in touch with him and he called me at home because I think it was some sort of holiday because I know it was there with the kids because they were upstairs. I had to go in the basement because they were so loud. 
<laughs> and we were just talking and he was telling me about his idea that he wanted to sort of start up this task force about diversity for AIG and would I be interested in, in helping out with it and you know, if I had any thoughts on it. And so I kind of told him some of my thoughts and what it is and stuff like that. And that's when the conversation started shifting to a hard left that I did not anticipate was that, how about you serve as chair? I'm like, wait, I, this ain't even a real task force yet. <laughs> you want me to be chair? I was like, yeah, because you you have like your ideas and what you're thinking with something like that. How about you lead the the task force? I was like, okay, because I was kind of hesitant because I was not an official member of AIG at this point. I had always worked with Ed, AIG like like some sort of ghost warrior on the end on the outside, but I never actually paid for a membership. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. somehow I kept finding myself at AIG events. And so I was like, all right, let's talk. And he said there was a few people who are of like minds with this. And so we met, we talked, and I sincerely felt he actually wanted to do this, that he had a desire to see this happen and that to to affect some sort of philosophical change within AIGA Mm -hmm. industry. You know, and I was like, okay, that's cool. And that's when I first met Rick. I went to a couple of their leadership meetings uh, out in uh, San Francisco to talk about the task force. I mean, I should have kind of seen it then when I gave that ta- that that speech. I forgot who I w- it was with somebody else that we were talking. I can't remember who it was. It was a last minute addition to the leadership summit. I kind of took that some kind of way. This is like, oh, here was last minute, but you're president because he was in his last <laughs> year. Now, I don't know how much pushback he might have gotten and have the experience I've had now. I kind of understand maybe why it was he was trying to push it through his last year because I think he really did meet a lot of resistance. And so I think he just found a way to pigeonhole it in there and stuff because we were one of the our presentation was sort of last. I really can't remember who the other person was. But the response from the leaders there, these were chapter leaders about, well, okay, you know, in terms of this diversity task force and chapters looking at it, what if we don't have any people of color here? Now, basically, let's put it straight. What if we don't have any black people? Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, diversity does not mean just black people. Now, I explained to him diversity means a group collection of different voices. You know? Yeah. And I said, okay, just because there may not be any black folks there, Latino folks, Asian folks there, you as white folks can still talk about diversity. There is different white folks too. <laughs> <You know? laughs> There's also the gay community, this disabled community. You can talk about diversity and how you can address practitioners of design who have been left out. Yeah. Now you can be a participant and not some sort of like, well, if you need help, I'll be over here, but I'm not going to do anything until you ask me. Now, the kind of sort of like snide blowback getting from that at that time kind of told me what we, what we were headed for. Now, um, but I was like, all right, fine. You know, this is about education. Let's school folks now. Because, yes, I knew some chapters, you know, they don't have any black people around. They probably never even seen in the been in the same room with a black person, let alone anybody else. So back in New York, formulating these plans with the, um, well, actually, no, we were doing that in San Francisco. We started burgeoning a task force. It was, oh, man, I'm so bad with names. I think Jose Nito out from Boston, Tracy Woods from St. Louis. It was a brother down south. I can't think of his name. I see his sight in my head. This a white lady from D.C. Mm-hmm. I can't remember her name and um, somebody else. We were sort of like the initial pool. And so we started trying to put up the strategies, what we're going to do, what's going to be the tenant of the uh, the task force. What are some of the things we're going to try and achieve? How do we talk to chapters about this? And I was assured that New York chapter, not New York chapter, but because it's always tricky because New York chapter is the headquarters. (laughs) So it's like, yeah. We were assured that headquarters would be 100% behind this. Rick said, yeah, we're going to do this. You know, I think Emily Woods is a name. I don't know if she was on the board or if she was from D.C. 
But there were some board members there or staff members from headquarters that were going to help coordinate this, set up some workshops, you know, help supplement our plans. In meetings that I had with Rick, I talked about some of my ideas and some of the research that I had, which I still have a copy of that letter, where essentially I outlined sort of the plan of what needs to be done with, you know, diversity task force in in the infancy stage. Because I knew, okay, I'm not going to hit you up with everything because <laughs> we got to convince you guys just to do a little bit first. Let's, and let's yeah. test the waters to see how serious you are about this before wasting all of our time doing this. And I basically was telling him, like, first and foremost, you can acknowledge you now the invisible designers out here, you now the invisible pioneers, both past and present. And that's when I mentioned the idea that became the design journeys. My plan was for that to be a roving ex- exhibition, going from chapter to chapter to chapter, like they do with other stuff. Gave them a whole list of current, at that time, current, because this was a 2006, current and past design professionals that they could focus on and recognize for not only just AIG and metal, but just to sort of make up for the, the, what's the word I'm looking for? The blind eye that they existed in and set paths for people. And again, I was assured, yeah, we're going to do this. We're going to help put this forth through. And so as I tried to set up, oh, that was the Cooper from Cooper Design in Pennsylvania, in Philadelphia. I forgot her name, her first name. As we were beginning to do and set up these programs with the assurances that Rick, the headquarters was going to be behind us, started having, as we try to put these planning meetings together, more and more of this initial task force, the participation wasn't existing. Folks sort of, some of them checked out. There was only about three of us who were actively meeting, conferring, Mm -hmm. talking, and trying to set stuff up. As they sort of slid off to the back burner, like, oh, we're engaging in the conversations or attending the meetings. As we try to put plans to Rick and the headquarters team is, okay, can we set this up? They were like, we're going to pass it to the board and talk about stuff and see if we can get allocations of resources. Nothing ever happened. It was always a talk. Mm. We'll get back to it. Let's talk about this. Now, what can we do? And that went on for about a year of just, okay, we'll get back and talk about it. And Mm -hmm. I was really getting very frustrated and pissed off about it because I'm like, okay, it's like this has been set up to fail from get-go. It's like yeah. headquarters is not doing anything. And then I got half this task force team that is MIA. It's like the three of us can't do all this stuff. And I'm not going to say the name, the three people that were there. Now, I'll, I'll keep that out. You know? Oh, man. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but they were very active. And yeah. the funny thing is they were active because we all shared the same thing. We were all people of color. Mm-hmm. Those who were the active members on this, with the exception of the lady from D.C., you know, the white lady from D.C., I have to say she was actually very active, too. So it was only it was from a, a biased perspective, so to speak. We had a vested interest in this happening, did not get that same vested interest from headquarters and from some of the task force members. And so as those task force members started whittling away, tried to shift the focus on, all right. Let's just stick with the task force members that are here and try and get some of uh, at least something jumped off from headquarters. They tied the uh, diversity task force into the mentoring program because it was high school art and design, where predominantly most of the students are black, Latino and Asian. Mm-hmm. But I was like, but that's already in place now. I mean, yeah, we can kind of put that but if you're trying to set this as a standalone we got to do something that puts us out first how about we first move with at the time i just i had it the invisible designer but it became design journeys so how about this exhibition now let's start introducing folks to these names now then there was this whole thing about money how would it be would it be a roving thing who can we put together and that's when i learned about the bureaucracy of aiga is ridiculous Mm. which i think is on purpose because they definitely can move stuff when they want to Um, Uh. (laughs) 
you know. And I'm big, holding I, my tongue. I'm holding my tongue so much, but but yeah, go. go. <laughs> I mean, the biggest. I'd say two of the biggest programs that they definitely moved fast was women in leadership, women in design. I forgot that, and then the mm-hmm. voting. Yeah. You know? Oh, they psh, they're moving heaven and earth to do that. Yep. And granted, yes, the women in leadership, great. You still didn't focus on anybody of color in there. Still a whole lot of white people. No, but you can move heaven and earth for that. You can't do it for there, where there could be potential sponsorship opportunities here, where you can get Adobe into this. You can get vendors that this is a necessary need because this broadens the industry. And quite honestly, if you just want to go business-wise, increases your sponsor's customer base because we all use the products that they do. We have to. This is our industry. So through all that, I mean, my time spent there was, like I said, we barely got a foot because it was all meetings and back and forth and conversations like, OK, we're going to set this up. And I'm like, all these emails that would have back and forth. I'm like, can we do something you now? And because of that inaction, basically, most of the members left because they're like, OK, nothing's going to happen. And then eventually... I was told, like, you know what? This chairpersonship should be every year, which I agree it should be every year. But I'm like, look, we haven't even done anything yet. Yeah. Because you know? the next chairperson after that was Jose Nito, who was part of the original task force. And they still didn't do anything. <laughs> no, they still didn't do anything. But then in 20, it was what? What was it? In 20, when was the first design studios thing when i got their promos and everything they held it at aig headquarters like that was in 20 something 20 i don't know when that, me, when I that might have been 2015 2016 maybe it was earlier than that maybe it was 20 i think it might have been earlier than that because the the only thing that came i saw came out of it was that in 2008 a year after i just basically left you know and the new chairperson came on board for the uh, dni task force they awarded George Olden the medal. And I was like, all right. So you took something out of the list. And then the subsequent years, I noticed they started pulling more of the names off that list, giving them AIGA medals. So I'm like, all right, cool. Now, in the beginning, a lot of it was the older ones who had some past, some were old. You know, yeah. I, I don't have the polite word to say, but... And I'm like, all right, so at least you're recognizing them. You're still not giving a context to it. No. So it's like a half ass kind of thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, let's just do this. It's going to make us because I it was definitely was done just to say, yeah, this is what we're doing. You know, we are recognizing diversity. We are recognizing our past invisible pioneers in the industry. Yeah. And that's all you need to know. They gave no context to it and anything like that. And then a few years later, they started recognizing some living folks, which I'm like, all right, you can mm-hmm. do a mix of living and past. It doesn't have to be one year's all dead. Now you start going <laughs> to living. But I noticed that they used quite a few of the names that was on the list that I provided. And I was like, all right, fine. All right, at least something happened. And I was like, you know, I still think it's for show. And then I got the ball, the bomb dropped in my mail when I got the promo cards for the Exhibition of Design Journeys. Mm -hmm. To say I almost felt like going down to AIG headquarters and lighting it up, I was pissed because they created it. I really thought it was just a empty shell of what it could have been. It definitely felt like a lip service. Like definitely, I mean, I wasn't doing it for any acknowledgement or anything like that, but the way they sort of did it was like it just was born out of them. Piss me off to no end. Still pisses me off to no end. Because mm. every conversation I have with them is like, oh, we didn't know you brought this to them. And I'm like, you MO, you mo- mo- foes. It- it's right there in black and white. Yeah. You know, emails, letters. Yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah, okay, whatever. You know, when I went to the thing, because they gave me the end, it's like, oh, come down, design journeys, blah, 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 this little promo. And I'm like, all right, you'd even spend the money for the kind of promos you do for everything else. It's this matte cardboard thing that looks like it came out my own printer. I was just ashamed to see that. And I went down there. It was just basically a wall of some names. And I'm like, this is really not a true testament to folks' legacies and their work. 
I mean, you're not even showing a full showcasing of their, their space, you know, not their space, but their, of their actual work and what they went into. I was not a fan of it. I thought the ex- exhibition design, I didn't particularly like. And then they turned it into this exercise of like, what is diversity to you? And the turnout was, say, IG's membership at that time, it was still predominantly white. Mm-hmm. Folks coming in, I'm reading some of the stuff and I just got offended by some of the stuff that I was reading there. Like diversity is, you know, having some black people, some white people. It's about uh, listening to a different perspective you don't necessarily have. Uh, But I'm like, okay, you're not really getting to the root of what it's supposed to be. Yeah. And this sort of like whiteboard exercise they had. I'm like, that means absolutely nothing. People are going to go in there. They're drinking their little wine. Like, oh, let's do this. Because I'm down for the cause. And then next day, what cause? What are you talking about? Yeah. So that incensed me. And I was just kind of done with AIG at that point. Because I had, you know, all the conversations I had with Rick. In the beginning, it started pleasant and nice. But towards the end, he definitely could tell my frustration. And I did start getting a bit raw which I don't think anyone's ever talked to him raw before, but you know, he's high in <laughs> academia and stuff. But I was like, at that time, I'm done with this bullshit. This is crap. I was like, you're not doing anything. And then he retires, you know, and they give him a big send off. And I'm like, all right, you know, yeah, you did great for AIGA, but you left a huge part of your membership underwhelmed. And that's how that came to be, this, this leadership. And it's like, I never really felt like I got a chance to do anything with the task force because it was such a step. The thing is, while going through all this, I came to City Tech because I was now teaching there and I would, would talk to Dorothy Hayes. And that's when, when I bumped into her and, and I was like, hey, by the way, let me tell you about this. We're doing this uh, diversity task force for AIJ. She was like, oh, God. I was like, what, what do you mean? Oh, God. You do know that's not the first time they've done that. I was like, <laughs> oh. it was like, yeah, we tried to do that in the 70s. Me, uh, I'm meaning her, Dorothy Hayes, and a few others, and we got nowhere. Mm-hmm. She told me, don't trust AIGA. They're going to give you the runaround. They're going to make you think they're doing all this stuff. You're going to do all this work, and it's going to leave you empty because in that, they will find an excuse why they can't do stuff. You know, because she said they're not interested. They're really not interested. They don't see the value in it. And that's, I have to say, came to fruition. To this day, I still don't think AIGA values what really DE&I really means about. Because at this point, I'm even saying that diversity, ah, get rid of that word. Now, that's becoming a trend word. It is very much about inclusion. Mm-hmm. You know, it's more about being included in the conversation. Diversity means, okay, I got a representative here, there, there. We're good. Those representatives don't mean nothing. It's like, you come here, you can't say nothing. Don't be seen. Just just look good. You know, at this point, it is about inclusion and equity. Giving me that same access to that power pie that you have. No, and not the crumbs. I don't want the crumbs. I want the pie. That's what's not, I don't think they value that. I don't think they understand the value of it or intentionally underplaying it. I don't know. but. So those early years to the subsequent later time that I came back onto the task force with AIGA under a different leadership, Mm -hmm. Julia, Julia Axenau, who I actually liked. I thought she was on point because it all comes down to leadership, because at the time it was Bill Grant who was pushing this, but his term ended. Yeah. The next president came in. He had a completely different agenda. Mm -hmm. And it was not about DNI. No, I forgot what he was working on. And then subsequently, every uh, board president after that has not picked up the ball with diversity. Let me do my let me stop saying diversity with inclusion and equity. (laughs) And then they brought in Julie. And that's I at that time, the task force leader then was Jacinda Williams uh, Walker. Jacinda Walker. Yeah. And Jacinda, I had met years ago from an OBD conference. Hmm. Yeah. And she was pegging me all these questions about AIGA. And I was telling her, because at the time, I didn't really know why. I was like, all right, cool. You want to know about AIGA? AIGA? Let me tell you the good, bad, and ugly. So that's what you're <laughs> So you make an informed decision. And she becomes you know, the, the chairperson, which Jacinda's got energy that's for days. Yes. Know, which is great. Yeah. Know? 
I'm not that kind of person. <laughs> so, you know, I loved how she reinvigorated and they actually that version of Task Force got more stuff done than I ever seen. Yeah. And I think a lot of it had to do with Julie. They were in sync. Now, mm-hmm. um and that got more traction and doing and things going on, which reinvigorated me, honestly. I got re inspired. I didn't want to do anything with leadership or anything like that. I was like, look, I'll just be in the back. I'll be a worker. Just, mm-hmm. just put me in the back. I'll work with you. I will say that was probably the best time working with AIGA was that iteration of the task force from, I think I rejoined what, 2017 mm-hmm. till 2018, till after Julie left. Yeah. Uh, that was great. There was things happening. And I really felt people were committed. The actually members were committed and that Julie was in committed to it. Now, the board is another thing. Yes. Which, at this point, I feel the board has more power than the actual executive director of AIGA. I did not feel the same energy from the board. So with that, you know, as we kept going through stuff and doing things and even the offshoots emerge, which was very interesting. And I actually enjoyed working with that, too. It was all about emerging designers. And that definitely was a more inclusive kind of recognizing designers and stuff like that. But Julie left. Now, AIGA has gone through a a major, major transformation. It seems like they no longer support any of these programs now because I don't know anything about, I haven't seen anything about Emerge. I no longer am a member of AIGA and won't go back as a member of AIGA because during that last part, when they had, once Julie was gone, they had the interim CEO um, or interim executive director. Barry. Yeah, Barry. Mm-hmm. Somehow they got wind. Uh, I forgot it was the engagement director or membership director who reached out to me because I had posted a medium story about my frustration with AIGA. Uh huh. And they reached out to me probably just to cover their ass and, you know, for press. <laughs> And like, oh, we didn't know this was going on. Explain us this. I'm like, yeah, I'll talk to you. I don't know why I'm talking to you. You're a me- membership person. Yeah. What are you going to do? Come to find out after I explain all this stuff. And so like, she left like three days later. She had a new job. <laughs> like, what? So that went nowhere. That went nowhere. Yeah. Know? And I was like, okay, you guys really like wasting my damn time. And you're going to see Brooklyn come out with that. You keep going. <laughs> you know? And so at that point, I was like, you know, I'm officially done. Yeah. I'm officially done. Julie's yeah. gone. I didn't like how that went down. Definitely you could see the support being pulled from the task force. Left folks up questioning, like, what's going on? What's mm-hmm. happening? You know, so folks started peeling back. And I was like, look, I'm not going through this road again. I'm like, I'm officially done. I, I ended my membership. The end of 2018, I let it lapse. I said, I'm not doing this anymore. I'll join somebody else. I'll go to SPD. From that point on, I've just seen AIJ sort of disintegrate when they appointed the new executive director, uh, Benny Johnson. I th- yeah, Benny Johnson. Right? Yeah, Benny F. Johnson. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, oh, wow. They actually appointed a black man. I'm mm-hmm. like, now, is that for sure? Are they actually really serious? So, but I hadn't seen anything with AIJ after that. It's like I saw slowly sort of started seeing all the initiatives being peeled away. Mm-hmm. And then to like now where DE and I task force is just a picture on the web page. That's it. You know, yep. They don't do anything. And now Benny's no longer the executive director, which will be news by the time people listen to this. But yeah. And that, I mean, what, three years? I mean, and I'm, again, that's crazy. So essentially that signals one of two things to me, that AIJ definitely may be in its death kneel or two. It really is lost in what it's trying to be now, because I don't think it serves its, it definitely does not serve its membership anymore. Definitely doesn't serve a segment of its membership. I mean, I still, I even though I still keep an eye on what AIJ is doing and some of the things, um, the conferences, don't get me started on AIG in New York because they do nothing. Uh, I don't see anything there. I will say I do see more faces or color on the speaker panels. Mm-hmm. 
which instinctually I'll say when I read the bios and stuff, I'm like, okay, you got folks of color here, but they're still not creative leads. You know, they're from other industries. If this is a design conference, show me the black design leadership. Show me the Latino design leadership. Asian American, not Pacific Asian, basically darker skin Asians. Mm -hmm. They're not represented, but you still have what I say, the Eastern Asian representation. That's still there, but you don't really have in terms of when it comes to a whole lot of brown folks up there that it is more from some ancillary industry Mm -hmm. that I'm like, that's great. You may have some inspirational stuff, but I want to know about people in my own industry, how they're leading, how they're faring, how their experience is to get where they're going. Now, I can't relate to somebody that's like speaking from, I don't know, they just got a motivational speaking company. I could care less about them. Now, give me somebody who's leading a top design company. I want to know the trials and tribulations with that. You know, So to me, I still see AIJ is doing this sort of face paint. Now, they're really not um, digging into it. I don't even see them really digging into it some of the major things that they always used to do. Um, it's dialed very back. So I just wonder if how long is AIGA going to be around and who's going to pick up that vacuum? Now, because um, it to me, it feels like there is a emptiness there of, of addressing this issue, leading me into OBD, which I thought would be a good variant to AIGA. They don't do much either. Now, because I got aware of them both around the same time as AIJ and OBD, because I learned about OBD back in, in the early 90s. Mm-hmm. And I just stumbled on that. I forgot how I found out about that. I think it might have been in How Design, where they were talking about the conference that they put on OBD did in Philadelphia back in, I think, 93. No, I think it was maybe 96. It was full blown. I mean, I saw... So many design professionals that look like me in in these companies I never heard about doing this amazing work that I really thought that was going to do something. And it did nothing. Yeah, it went nowhere after that. But that's for a whole host of other reasons of internal fighting and the genders and what are they really after? You know, seemed like it was somebody's method of supporting themselves and you know, it's just a lot of sort of, again, empty promises that kind of went nowhere that didn't really, you know, help the community at large and stuff. But it did at least that conference show me that I'm, I wasn't alone. And that's that was just the one thing I wanted to do with AIGA so that beginning students, the students coming into design know that they're not alone, that there's other people out here that look like them that may have similar stories so that they can look up to and, and aspire to. I still try to do that to this day to let people know that you're not alone, you know, that there are folks out here. You know, they may not get the shine, but it's up to us to give the shine to them and stuff. Yeah. But that that was the experience with AIGA. Wow. So much of what you described just now is like point by point what my experience was like being on the DNI task force with AIGA, like mm-hmm. the, it almost felt like your hands were tied at some point. Like you couldn't yeah. say anything. You couldn't do anything. We had a large amount of members. Most of them never said a word. They just weren't out there. And it was clear that yeah. for the people that were people of color that were out there, we were sort of being elevated more as like the main group to the point mm-hmm. almost where the group was more so associated with us personally than it was with AIGA. And so like when people started leaving, because when I came on, which was in 2014, Antoinette Carroll was a Mm co-chair with this woman, Aiden O'Connor, who worked at AIGA. Antoinette was positioning to have a full-time diversity and inclusion employee at AIGA headquarters because she was making the case that like this affects everything. This affects membership. This affects other organizations like having it as like the side thing along with you know women in design and voting and stuff it it sort of like takes it off of the main plate it sort of it doesn't give it as much prominence as it should and i know she was lobbying for that to happen it didn't happen aiga eventually hired like this diversity and inclusion fellow i think 
who worked with the task force for a while, this guy named Obed Figueroa, he yeah, left. Obed. Yeah. And then people just kind of started dropping off the task force left and right. I left in 2017, not too long after Julie left the organization. Mm-hmm. And it's funny you mentioned Jacinda. I brought Jacinda in. So oh, okay. I had met Jacinda prior to AIGA through, I had heard about the work she was doing with the organization of black designers and mm-hmm. um, with this studio out in Cleveland called go media. They were putting together this event called weapons of mass creation fest every year. Mm-hmm. And Jacinda was on their ass about like, how come you all do this every year in like black ass Cleveland and ain't mm-hmm. no black people here. How is that? What is that? Yeah. She was getting on them about it. That's when I first learned about her. And then she knew about the stuff I was doing with AIGA. And I was like, well, you should you should join. I feel like you can take what you're doing on this local level and really amplify it. Yeah. This is before I knew how much they would tie our hands to do anything like everything yeah. had to go through like a particular AIGA conduit. This woman yep. that worked there. I'll say it. She was racist. She was racist. Hands down. I'm not oh, going to say yes. allegedly she yeah. was she was racist and like we would mention stuff to her and the thing was us the people of color on the task force put this together like we put two and two together and was like wait a minute why is she telling you one thing and telling me another thing and she'd send us these like random emails that looked like a ransom note because she would copy and paste mm-hmm. from all these different places and it just pissed a lot of people off because it was like we can do more individually than being part of this task force with this organization yeah. because you won't let us say anything through AIGA. We can't do anything. Like we couldn't even get an Instagram profile. Like mm-hmm. the design journeys and all that stuff. Yeah. We would recommend people. They would never push that stuff through. A lot of us left after that. I know Jacinda was chair for a while. I know mm-hmm. she left. And I think the only person that might still be around, because after I left, I know Douglas Davis has been on the show before. He also teaches yeah. at City Tech. Mm-hmm. He was doing stuff with them this woman out of dc pim her was doing stuff george garastegui who's in in new york was doing things and carlos estrada who's out of aiga detroit Mm -hmm. i want to say carlos might be like the last surviving (laughs) member of the task force because i don't think george is doing anything with them i don't think pim is doing anything i know jacinda's not i want to say Carlos is like the last person standing, but like the way that AIGA internally eroded that task force from within, I mean, it was like an ulcer just eating away at everyone's motivation. Like we were trying to do surveys and case, we were trying to do all sorts of things that everything would just get, nope, shot down, don't want to do it, can't do this, 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 that, and third. And like, I was lucky to have Revision Path and still fall on that. And they did like one or two features about Revision Path. But then people would say, well, how come you have Maurice doing Revision Path and doing 28 Days of the Web? And like AIGA isn't doing something like that. And I was like, you got to talk to them about that. I don't know nothing about how to get things on the website. It was a pain to get anything on the website because it had to go through another channel. And it was just... It was a mess. It was an absolute mess. And when I left and I rescinded my membership, I want to say in 2017, 2018, I still sort of kept tabs with the organization or rather I should say the organization kept tabs with me because they would, because <laughs> they would keep hitting me up about stuff and like different chapters would hit me up. And I'm like, leave me alone. I don't want to mess with you. And I mean, it got to the point, especially with my local chapter with AIG Atlanta, I literally had to go to them and say, keep my name out your mouth. I know you are using me. You're, you're dropping my name to get other people in here. You're dropping my name about stuff. It's coming back to me. Keep my name out your fucking mouth. And, and to this day, they don't, I mean, you know, it's whatever, but I say all that to say, you know, Benny came on 2019, 2020-ish, and I had him on the show. We talked about, you know, the importance of him coming on as like the first black person in the organization's 100-year history. I know there was a lot that tried to, you know, he tried to do. Mm -hmm. The pandemic, I think, also just threw a wrench in a lot of things, and I'm not using that as an excuse. But, Mm -hmm. like, you know, I don't know what AIGA is going to do now because, you know, like I said, by the time this airs, News will have went out that Benny is no longer the executive director. I don't know who else they're bringing in. And as you've said, and as I know, 
DNI through AIGA is only as strong as whomever the executive director is that's championing for it. Yeah. Without them being the person at the top to say we're doing X, Y, Z, nothing really happens. Yeah. And I've been on the nominating committee for the board. So I, I see how the board operates. I know how that operates. And they do hold a lot of power. They can oust an ED. They've done it before. Yeah. So I don't know. AIGA is, um, look, if you, <laughs> if you're a designer and you hear the sound of my voice and you are actively paying dues, to AIGA. And I'm not saying don't do this, but I'm saying really take a hard look at what the organization provides for you as a modern designer. Exactly. And I say modern because for a long time, AIGA did not acknowledge UX. They didn't acknowledge product design. And the Mm -hmm. reality is a lot of working designers now that work for tech companies or other places are UX designers. They are product designers. They're experienced designers. There are other designers that's not just visual or web. And I don't, I mean, I feel like the organization has started to acknowledge that a bit through some events, but like, what is the value of an AIGA membership to the modern designer? If you didn't go to design school and you picked up everything, you know, from YouTube or, or courses or a boot camp or something, and you're working as a, a mid-level product designer at a tech company, what importance is AIGA going to be to you? How is it really helping you as a career professional outside of just saying you're a member? I mean, I could be a member of the Subway Sub Club, but that don't mean anything <laughs> to the random person. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. yep. And I'm comparing this to RGD in Canada. Like, yeah. If you're an RGD member and you're an RGD registered designer, that means something to yeah. companies because yeah. they found a way to really – like get themselves a part of the business community. Yeah. I don't think being an AIGA designer now saying you're a member of AIGA really okay. means anything when you try to get a job or you're talking to clients as a freelancer. I don't think that means anything. It probably means something on a more local level, depending on the visibility of the chapter. Exactly. But like as a whole, what does it mean? So I'm not telling people, to give up their memberships. I am asking them to take a hard look at the money that they're paying mm-hmm. and see, is it really worth it? Yeah. Yeah, you're right. I mean, cause I, I mean, Canada, <sighs> I've been contemplating moving to Canada mainly because of how the design community is looked at up there. Mm-hmm. Know, I actually like the idea of registering as a graphic designer. You know, I like that sort of, classification that Canada does because it seems like it has a more of a value added perk to you as a, as a working professional and signifies that, you know, Hey, you know what you're doing and you're the real deal and that we're going to help you with that. Mm -hmm. And I I mean, for a whole host of reasons, I, I, you know, it'll be like pulling teeth through, I don't know what in the U S to do something like that, but I don't look upon AIGA in the same light as I did 20 years ago. I don't look at it as like, oh, that they're going to help me. Because honestly, in my career, has AIGA ever gotten me a job? No. Has AIG ever really connected me to any of the superstars within AIGA? No. I've met some in passing through meetings and workshops, but no one's ever really vested any interest in like trying to talk to me more than just, hey, how you doing? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've actually been kind of shunned by some folks in AIGA. A lot of the events that I used to go to, every time I kind of step in, I'd always get this sort of like, look like, what are you doing here? Mm -hmm. Even when I went into the headquarters, the last time I went to the headquarters for for something, I forgot what it was. I mean, the staff there was looking at me like, and they were younger than me. I mean, Mm -hmm. looking at me like, who's this black man in here? What are you doing? Yeah. I'm just like, oh, so I it tell students that I tell them AIG is a good resource to find information. Now, that's what I look at AIGA as of right now, just an information tool. I still think AIG has very good in terms of the business information they have on there. It's great. I don't need to get in. I don't need to talk to anybody about that. I can just pull off the information, look at the resources and stuff like that. Cool. You're a great library for that. But for uh, the true socialization and the true advancement for designers, as I'm seeing now, as I've, I guess I fall into the seasoned category now, <laughs> um, 
I don't see them doing anything about seasoned professionals. It's more like you don't exist. We're only focused on designers up to 30. Yeah. Now, and I try to tell students like, you know, it's a good resource for that information. But as a member, really think about the value that you may get out of it. You go to some initial events to see how you think about it and see if you see any concrete pros and cons is going to help you personally now from that experience. And being that the fact that the national headquarters is the New York City chapter is a double-edged sword because I'm like, the New York City chapter, honestly, is like to me, is dead as a door now. Now, they don't do much. Now, they didn't do much before COVID. They don't do much now. And it's like, so if you join that, you know, what is it really helping you? Now, and, and I hate saying that to folks, but I don't want them to go through the experience I've went through. Mm-hmm. Yeah, especially when there's other organizations that I see. Yeah, they're not necessarily, they're more of a specific design orientation, like Society of Publication Designers. Yeah. They seem a lot more active and a lot more forward thinking on what they're trying to do and who they showcase and, and how they extend stuff. I'm really thinking about joining them. I'm kind of gun shy because I'm like, do I really want to join another organization at like almost $300 a year? I don't know. I don't know. And then walk away feeling unsatisfied because I could do something else with that money. But I mean, it is tempting, at least what I see in the presence of what they do. They're far and above more stuff than what AIG does. Their big fo- AIG's big focus is their, their conference. Yeah, and I think that's just a money driver. And it's it's I think it's fair for folks to start questioning the value of it. And if it's not of value, then it's time to either create something brand new or maybe just dissolve it completely now and, and rethink this whole process from scratch. Yeah. I, don't I mean it's it's interesting because like yeah, you're right. You're right. I don't have anything to add. No notes. <laughs> ten out of ten. Right. <laughs> Yeah, so. What gets you truly excited about what you do? It's different nowadays. I'm approaching, I guess, 30 some odd years, 32 years working because I started working as a sophomore in college. What gets me excited now about what I do is not so much. I'm not driven by the money anymore, which is kind of backwards to say, <laughs> but I actually just like sort of trying to educate people about what design really is in terms of a strategic path. Mm -hmm. And because I think too many people see design as just, you know, make me something pretty. And I'm like, no, it's a lot more deeper than that. It's about a strategic path on how you can make your company's voice sing. You know, and I like doing that. I get more excited about doing work for non for profits because they're doing some really good work, a lot of them. But when you come across them, you're like, oh, my God, what is this? You know, <laughs> it's like there's no thought, no rhyme or reason. They look mismanaged when the organizations really aren't. You know, yeah. They have a plan. They know what they're doing. It's just the only thing is their front facing is not as organized as their internal specter. And that stuff is what gets me excited today is doing a lot of not-for-profit dare I say, pro bono work, <laughs> where taking away, I mean, yeah, I do nonprofit work at a discounted rate, but like your pro bono stuff, you take away the money thing and you just focus on just creating to help them just for the altruistic nature. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I just get a very different feeling. It just really inspires me because it's it's like I'm helping you become better you now to help you take yourself to another level. Um, Mm -hmm. that you deserve to be at, you know, and that I find in this aspect of my career is what truly motivates me today. If folks are willing, I like telling them about design and and how it helps and what it can do, which is why I like teaching, you know, and I think design education is, is paramount, both for clients and students, you know, because I think as a designer, you know, I think it's our responsibility to also educate our clients about the, the power of design and what it truly is. But teaching, I feel like with all the experience and everything, 
that I've gained over these 30 years, I feel I've been very fortunate and blessed. My career has gone through so many different curves. It's nowhere where I initially started seeing myself, where I envisioned it's going to be some high-powered VP of design at some <laughs> mega billionaire company where I'm jetting from country to country and stuff like that. No, I, that doesn't appeal to me now on stuff. What appeals to me is like just passing forward this design legacy to beginnings designers and so that they have a better experience than what I have had in my beginning journeys and stuff. And so that that's what excites me today. What does success look like now? I mean, you're at this point in your career where you have really like seen design through all these different changes. Of course, now you mentioned, you know, being a design educator. Yeah. What does success look like? I will say immediately right off the top of my head, some of the successes I like is when some of my former students have landed jobs that they really wanted and they come back and say they actually really value what I've done and help push them to be better than what they were when they were studying. They say, well, yeah, you know, you're a little bit of a hot ass, but, you know, <laughs> I get why you did that. I, yeah. I, it's got me where where, where I, I am today and where, you know, okay, we still keep in touch. They'll contact me about industry advice, just to, just basically to have an air. That's a success to me. But overall, I just find success in that if I can actually just help someone or an organization just sort of put their message out a little bit clearer. Now that they feel better about themselves, that I feel is a success to me. Now, that's how I'm counting that. It's like, how well does my you know, knowledge or how does my help make them feel better about what they're doing and stuff like that? I, I, to me, I feel that's more of a success I count today. Now, I'm not discarding money. I, you know, I still need <laughs> money, but I'm not driven by that. And that, that's a fleeting Success because I've been there when it's been coming in like buckets, and then when it's like the Sahara Desert, you know, <laughs> it is more of the untangible successes that I think is great because that's what's lasting now. So, if I can help somebody else, they will remember that, and that just helps propel them. So, while the name may not be there, the root of that help grows forever now. and I mean, who doesn't want that? That's eternal. That's great. You know, and, and I find that success. Yeah, that's how I'd answer that. Mm -hmm. If that's clear, I don't know. <laughs> I think so, yeah. Now, this might be a harder question to answer, but I'll, I'll ask it. Like, uh -oh. where do you see yourself in the next five years? Like, what kind of work do you want to be doing? Yeah, I'm actually asking myself that now. I've been toying with the idea of in about five years, which... I'll be 60, which I still can't get my head wrapped around. <laughs> oh, God, Lee, I got to take a breath on that one. <laughs> um, <laughs> in five years, I still want to be a practicing designer, but I want to see myself pull back. I want to see where it's, I'm doing design more at a leisurely, a leisurely pace. I see myself still teaching part time, but in a different scenario where I'm really seriously contemplating on starting my master's next year to be able to teach at any you know, institution mm -hmm. uh, because you need a master's to do to move around outside of um, where I'm teaching at community college. And I'm 75 percent sure I think I may actually move from being an in-house designer and going back to a full time studio. I'm thinking in five years, I may want to resurrect a physical entity of, of straight design, which it probably will not be called straight design because I'm thinking about re rebranding myself completely. Mm -hmm. um, but that's sort of where I see, I, I don't see myself ever retiring because people say, well, okay, you know, five years, you'd be 60, then the 65. What about retirement? No, I can't do retirement. I have some friends who have retired early. Mm -hmm. They look bored as crap. You know? <laughs> and I can't do that. And the thing is, I still feel design. I yeah. still get very much invigorated when I see great design. 
I still keep my nose to what's happening in the industry as, as fast as it's changing. And I'm also very interested in that. I'm hoping in, in the next, within the next five years that I can actually transition into a field that, you know, kind of piques my curiosity and that's motion graphics. Whether or not to get a full-time gig for that, eh. But to be able to offer that as as a service and and to be honest, just to be selfish, I just think it looks cool. I, I've done a little bit of motion graphics now and it's intriguing. It's fascinating. And it's, it's just, um, it's fun. You know, it's fun doing that to take this static idea and bringing it into a motion life is something that, you know, I'd like to, to do more of, especially since I see that as the way design will start changing as, as we move from the platform of the basic augmented and virtual reality platforms we have now, which is, is clearly in, in its, its cell phase. I can't even call it embryo. It's still in the cell that doing something. And, and even though I'm not a, I can't say I'm a big fan of social media. It has its place, but I like the premise of how you, not necessarily the still aspect of motion, uh, uh, still aspect of social media, like how Instagram originally started, that it was all photos. Now it's all videos, you know? So yeah. you might as well just say you TikTok. But that aspect of promoting stuff from a brand ad perspective is fascinating to me because that's where you can apply the motion graphics to that. I it's high hopes, but I kind of see myself doing more of that in five years. So I, like I said, I'm dabbling a little bit right now with it that I'm trying to in- incorporate a little bit more into my full-time job to feel comfortable enough to be able to offer that to clientele. That's about as far as I can see what I think myself in five years, because in just the last five years, I've gone through such a major transition professionally and personally that I've learned I'm not trying to forecast anymore mm-hmm. you know, because um, <laughs> tomorrow could be very different right then and there. So five years could be a very, very long way of ways and many different things go. But that's kind of where I see my vision board for five years might be. And that could change next week, too, because I have become very sort of um, transitory. I've been mm-hmm. very flexible about, oh, where we're going to go. I don't know. Let's let's see where the journey takes us, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> um, because at this point, I don't feel I need to prove anything to anybody. I don't need to prove anything to myself. I actually just want to enjoy myself. And I just want to contribute with, especially more so in terms of, wow, I'm, as I'm listening to myself in my head, um, as I'm thinking about this, that. Lord, help me. Do I want to actually become more of a social activist? I don't know. I'd like to actually to, you know, as these issues are popping up more and more in society, as a global society, because you can't really say we're stuck in our own little neighborhoods anymore, but that I want to sort of do my part and help on that kind of scale. So, yeah, in some part, that also, too, is in that projection for the next five years. Maybe it's a lofty idea, but it, it's something that's kind of sparking some initial interest now that I want to see how that um, once I plant these seeds, where it may grow within five years. But that's what I see. Still doing my stuff and just, you know, hopefully still looking as young as I do now. Uh, <laughs> for five years and just hoping my kids are. Uh, Because they seem to, my son's on this creative journey that I hope he's successful in what he's doing and helping guide him as much as I can, as well as my daughter who is still trying to find herself. But she has a really strong creative base, even though she keeps trying to deny it, to make certain that them, uh, that they, if they choose, if, like I said, my son, make certain that his career path is, you know, as solid as it can be, and to really try and guide my daughter, because by that time she'll be going to college, kind of push her to be a creative too, you know, so, Mm -hmm. you know, that's what I see. Well, just to wrap things up here, where can our audience find out more information about you, about your work and everything? Where can they find that online? They can find me on my website, um, straight design, 
LLC.com. But the domain is not spelled as you would say straight. It's um, STR, the number eight, the letter T, design, LLC.com. Um, had to play off of that because somebody took the domain straight design. <laughs> um, they can find me there. They can also find me on Instagram as straight design, spelled as you just say it on Instagram. That's generally my main two points where you can find me. Because I'm my own, my social media presence really is con- contained to just Instagram. I no longer use Twitter, and I don't really use anything else. I just use Instagram and my basic website. All right, sounds good. Well, Andrew Bass, wow. I mean, I knew that this was going to be a great conversation, but mm-hmm. this was like a conversation and a history lesson. And a therapy session like this was so much (laughs) wrapped into one. I mean, first of all, I just want to thank you for just the work that you've done. I mean, a lot of what you've done in terms of just educating and then also even the work with AIGA has really kind of set the platform for me to even do what I do here with Revision Path. Like you were one of the the first people that I interviewed back before this was all a podcast and everything. And to see that you know, you're still continuing to do this work throughout the years that you can really speak truth to history about Mm -hmm. how things have went and how technology has changed design and everything. I hope folks get a chance to really listen to both parts of this episode or these episodes, I should say, to really get the full breadth of what it is that you bring to the design community. And I hope to see you honored one day, you know, I'm, not, I mean, through AIGA, hope, you know, maybe we'll see. I don't know. But like, I think nah. what, you, what you've brought to the design industry is indispensable. And I just want to thank you so much for sharing that perspective here uh, with our audience. So thank you for coming on. I appreciate it. Well, I, I thank you for that. And I thank, I thank you for, you know, interviewing me. It was a really cool talk. Great to listen and listen to hearing myself talk. And actually, it was very therapeutic to actually, you know, share some of the some of the agony going through some of this and just trying to, you know, lay the groundwork for future folks, trying to lessen the burdens that they're going to have to face. Um, And the fact that in 2022, coming into 2023, that this is still going to have to go on is, it's sort of mind numbing to me, but it's still very much the fight to happen. I may not have as much fire in this fight as I used to, because I'm Taking a reprieve and burnt, taking a t- step back because you know, it does kind of wear you down a bit. Um, yeah. But I'm kind of been refreshing myself to like, you know what, let's throw my hat back in this one last time. <laughs> <laughs> you know? um, just mean it won't be with AIGA. It will be actually doing through some other things because forget that. It's time to go to other other means out there and actually just basically ourselves because I don't. I still have floating in my head, even though we've had OBD, uh, no, yeah, OBD, which has had mixed results. I still feel very much that if this is going to change is that we have to do it for ourselves, you know, completely yeah. independent and self-sustained. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. I believe that. Again, thank you so thank much you. for coming on the show. I appreciate it. No problem. Thank you. Big thanks to Andrew Bass, and of course, thanks to you for listening. You can find out more about Andrew and his work through the links in the show notes at revisionpath.com. Revision Path is brought to you by Lunch, a multidisciplinary creative studio in Atlanta, Georgia. This podcast is created, hosted, and produced by me, Maurice Cherry, with engineering and editing by RJ Basilio. Our intro voiceover is by Music Man Dre, with intro and outro music by Yellow Speaker. Transcripts are provided by Brevity and Wit. This episode of Revision Path is also brought to you by Hover. Building your online brand has never been more important, and that begins with your domain name. Show the online community who you are and what you're passionate about with Hover. With over 400 plus domain extensions to choose from, including all the classics and fun niche extensions, Hover is the only domain provider I use and trust. Go to hover.com forward slash revision path and get 10% off your first purchase. So what did you think of the interview? Better yet, what do you think about the podcast overall? 
Of course, we would love to hear from you on social media, so please don't be a stranger. Hit us up. We're on Twitter. We're on Instagram. Just search for Revision Path, all one word. Or you can leave us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or on Spotify. The more people you tell about the show, the bigger we become. And the further we can extend our reach to talk to black designers, developers, artists, and other digital creatives from all over the world. As always, thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next time.